So the dish gruel kind of gets a bad rap, partly I think because of its name, gruel. But I figure it can't be all that bad. After all, Oliver Twist asked, Please, sir, I want some more. So I figured I'd give it a go and make my own 19th century bowl of gruel. So thank you to Trade for sponsoring this video as we make gruel, this time on Tasting History. So recently I did a video about the third class food served aboard the Titanic, and I mentioned how one of the dishes that they had for supper was gruel, and frankly people were aghast because gruel has a terrible reputation. And some of that bad reputation may be a little bit deserved, but not all of it. See, gruel could run the gamut from quite flavorful versions made with spices and herbs and meat down to the watery gruel of the Victorian workhouse, and even crusty brand imitation gruel. Nine out of ten orphans can't tell the difference. So I've decided to make a recipe that's sort of in the middle and not just because it has brandy. The recipe is from John Mollard's 1804 cookbook, The Art of Cookery Made Easy and Refined. And I can't help but think that his title was kind of cashing in on the best-selling cookbook of the time, The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy by Hannah Glass. I guess it's like how after Twilight came out, every movie for like five years was about vampires. So it's like that, but with 18th century cookbooks. Oatmeal pottage, or gruel. Mix together three tablespoonfuls of oatmeal, a very little salt, and a quart of water. Put it over a fire and let it boil gently for half an hour. Then skim it and strain it, add to it an ounce of fresh butter, some loaf sugar, a little brandy, and grated nutmeg. Then boil it again five minutes. Mix it till very smooth and let it be of a moderate consistence. So as you can see, while it's gruel, it's not that far off from what you might have for breakfast today, minus the brandy. And usually I forego the brandy for my breakfast and instead have a nice cup of coffee from today's sponsor, Trade. Since moving to the new house, one of my favorite things to do is to get up in the morning and have a cup of coffee outside while listening to the birds. And the coffee, which helps motivate me to finish unpacking, is always top notch because it comes from Trade. Like this cup of Alma coffee. It has a light bright roast with almost a citrus quality to it. Perfect for my palate. See, with Trade, you just take a simple quiz to let them know your taste preferences and how you take your coffee, then they match you with some of the freshest roasts which come to you directly from independent roasters around the country. They're so confident that they can match your taste the first time that if you don't like it, they will send you a new bag for free. And you can get started by taking the simple quiz at drinktrade.com slash tastinghistory to let Trade find a coffee you'll love. And right now, Trade is offering my viewers a total of $30 off of your first order plus free shipping when you go to drinktrade.com slash tastinghistory or just click the link in the description. Now the offer won't last forever, so make sure to take advantage of it while you can. That's drinktrade.com slash tastinghistory for $30 off. And with your coffee in hand, let's get making some gruel. So for this recipe, what you'll need is three tablespoons of Scottish or steel cut oatmeal, a pinch of salt, one quart or one liter of water, two tablespoons or 28 grams of unsalted butter, one tablespoon of sugar, two tablespoons of brandy, and both of those ingredients are really to taste, as is the 1 8 teaspoon of nutmeg. So first add the oatmeal and the salt to the water, then set it over medium heat and bring to a gentle boil. Let it boil for 30 minutes and then, per the recipe, skim off the scum that is sure to form on top of the gruel. Gruel scum, that can't do much for the dish's reputation. Also, gruel scum sounds like it could actually be a character from a Dickens novel. Obadiah gruel scum. Anyway, skim off anything that isn't oats, then mix in the butter and add the sugar, brandy, and nutmeg. Stir until the butter is melted in, and then set it back over the flame for another five minutes or until it's as thick as you like it. And while it thickens, make sure you're subscribed to Tasting History and make sure to ring that notification bell for when it is rung, that calls the orphans to their breakfast of gruel. So gruel can really apply to a whole array of dishes. The word likely comes from the Frankish word grut, meaning coarse meal, and that is essentially all it is. Grain that hasn't been fully ground into flour mixed with some sort of liquid. The most common grains are barley or oats, but some are made with hemp, millet, corn, rice, or even acorns. The Saxon bruit, an almond version of which I made when I first started the channel, is essentially a gruel, as are the kanji dishes in and around China and the pulse that was common in ancient Rome. Honestly, gruel is probably one of the oldest dishes that humans ever made, but it didn't get its name gruel until around the Middle Ages. 
there are several types of gruel that crop up in a number of medieval manuscripts, the two most common being drawn gruel, which is made with some grain, parsley, sage, and beef, and then gruel aforcent, or reinforced gruel. This was basically oatmeal with eggs, pork meat, pork rinds, and then covered with saffron. Now both of those are definitely on the fancier end of the gruel gamut, because most people would have had a simpler gruel or porridge of just the grain and either water or maybe some ale or almond milk on a good day. And that form of the dish was made partly as a way to save money. See, in much of medieval Europe, you were not allowed to grind your own grain. You had to take it to the miller, my ancestors, and pay them to grind it, a portion of which would also go to the lord of the manor. But with gruel, you could just give your grain a little mash with your mortar and pestle and nobody would be the wiser. You could also turn it into a form of bread without the need of an oven, because ovens were also usually communal and charged a fee. So you could cook the gruel in a pot on your hearth and then cover it and let it dry out to become a sort of energy bar. Later in history, in many Scottish households, they actually had a dedicated porridge drawer. Kids want a snack with their sunny delight? Any good mom will send them to the porridge drawer. Though if you let it sit in just the right circumstances, it can actually start to ferment and will become an early form of beer. Now these types of gruel stuck around for several centuries, though the meat eventually was replaced with more sweet ingredients. One recipe from 1669 calls for oats to be boiled until it rise in a great ebullition, in great galloping waves. And ebullition is my word of the day, and it refers to the action of boiling. The gruel was then mixed with cream, nutmeg, sugar, butter, rose water, an egg, and a bit of white wine. He also suggests rosemary or currants being added, but these fancy gruels were not to last. By the mid-18th century, cookbooks that had recipes for plum gruel for the healthy among us also had recipes for what was usually called water gruel for the more sickly set. In Jane Austen's novel Emma, the valetudinarian, or what we would call today a hypochondriac, Mr. Woodhouse espouses the health-giving properties of gruel. My poor dear Isabella, how tired you must be after your journey. You must go to bed early, my dear, and I recommend a little gruel to you before you go. My dear Emma, suppose we all have a little gruel, a basin of nice, smooth gruel, thin but not too thin. Though Mr. Woodhouse's infirmity seems to be rather psychosomatic, unlike that of poor Giles Collins from the now-forgotten nursery rhyme of the same name. His mother, she made some water gruel, and stirred it round with a spoon. Giles Collins, he ate up his water gruel, and died before twas noon. Noon, and died before twas noon. Old nursery rhymes are really, really dark. Also, the boy's death so soon after eating gruel couldn't have done much for its reputation. So gruel's association with the invalid, a term we don't really use today, was definitely not good PR for the dish. But in the 19th century, its reputation would be tarnished pretty much irreparably. Now, it had long been associated with the poor, but the link would be set in stone with that most infamous of Victorian institutions, the workhouse. And the workhouses of England were an interesting place. Originally, they were designed as a place of refuge for those most destitute of paupers. But the conditions inside were often little better than those on the streets. That said, you were not forced to go into the workhouse. Rather, you had to apply. You would go before the Board of Guardians to plead your case. And then if you were accepted, you would be put to work, as the name suggests, but you would also get a place to sleep and food. Though Dickens writes that it often was not enough food to really live on. Writing in Oliver Twist about a meeting of the board of the workhouse, he says, They established the rule that all poor people should have the alternative of being starved by a gradual process in the house or by a quick one out of it. With this view, they contracted with the waterworks to lay on an unlimited supply of water and with a corn factory to supply periodically small quantities of oatmeal, and issues three meals of thin gruel a day with an onion twice a week and half a roll on Sundays. And while he definitely took some literary license, it wasn't all that much. Because in the British Farmer's Magazine from 1849, they lay out the workhouse inmates' diet, and they did call them inmates, and they lay it beside that of prison inmates. Workhouse fare. Breakfast, eight ounces bread, and a pint and a half of broth, gruel, or milk. Prison diet. Breakfast, one pint of cocoa sweetened with three-quarter ounces of molasses or sugar and six ounces of bread. 
The prisoners get cocoa and sugar, and for dinner they tended to get a lot more meat and potatoes than did their workhouse counterparts. The author of the article was actually writing to protest the diet of the prisoners being made better, as this would operate as a direct premium to crime. And he says that something that has happened in the past and will surely happen again is insubordination in the workhouse for the purpose of being committed to prison as the preferable place of confinement. So don't make the workhouse food better, just keep the prison food worse. That was his solution. Though it seems that many workhouses, especially those outside of London, had much better fare and actually the, the people in the workhouses ate pretty well. And it was just those with poor rations that gave the whole lot a bad name. And a bad name they had, as did Gruel. See, in 1852, the term actually became synonymous with really hard work, grueling work. Though in the century previous, the term to get one's gruel meant to receive a punishment, so maybe the association with hard work is actually an improvement. Now in the US, workhouses, while they did exist, did not have the same connection to gruel as they did in England. And so the dish remained mostly known for its remedial properties. In 1860, the Opelousas Courier in Louisiana published an advertisement for sanitary gruel. This truly hygienic composition is a natural preparation of a pleasant taste. So much so that it is used as a relish by those in good health and an infallible remedy in case of sickness. Really not sure why they had to use quotation marks around the word natural, that's not very reassuring, but they did claim that it would help with all manner of stomach issues and even the most obstinate constipation yields to the daily use of the invigorating gruel. So keep that in mind as we take our gruel off the stove. And here we are, 19th century gruel. Now it was really, really watery, but in that last five minutes it started to kind of thicken up, so now it's like, just like a very thin oatmeal or porridge. I mean, and really that's, that's what it is, is the other ingredients that, that make it um, rather different from what we typically eat today. Here we go. Mmm. Mmm. Well, that's, well, that's mighty fine. So the first thing that hits you is the nutmeg. Boom. But then you get the brandy, but you only get the flavor of the brandy without any of the burn. Like it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's alcoholic, but you get the wonderful flavor of that brandy, that kind of dark flavor. Also, the, um, the consistency is, is really nice. It's very, very smooth because we use that Scottish oatmeal rather than rolled oats. They wouldn't have used rolled oats, used Scottish oatmeal or, or steel cut oatmeal. So yeah, I could see why Oliver Twist would maybe want some more of this, though I'm guessing he didn't have almost any of the ingredients and his was a lot more watered down. But still, after a long day at the workhouse, I would want more gruel too. So go make yourself a bowl of gruel. Follow me on Instagram, Tasting History with Max Miller, and I will see you next time on Tasting History. I'm actually going to finish this gruel. I never thought I would say that. Hmm.